Okay, here's an update on homemade mushroom grow bags. This actually kind of looks a little contaminated, but you know what? I guess that's just what dead man's fingers look like whenever they are starting to put off these little fruits. Look at that. These grow bags work perfectly. Now, after this was fully colonized, I did, like you do with any other mushroom bag, cut. I, at first, I cut just a couple little X's in here to see if the uh, mushrooms would start to grow out of just those little holes that I initially made in the bag. Uh, but they seem to, like at least this species, seems to not really care exactly where the fresh air is as long as there's enough of it to start putting off fruits. Because here on the front, you can see that there's just a lot of these really little cute mushrooms growing here. But on the back, there's a lot of them growing on there too. And that's there's no hole on the back whatsoever. But yeah, no, this seems to be a fantastic way to grow sample mushrooms on whatever substrate you want to test without having to spend a lot of money on a regular mushroom grow bag. Just make them out of the vacuum bags like I showed here and you should be pretty good to go as long as you just follow the steps that you normally would with a purpose-made mushroom grow bag and this one right here this is actually one of the first test bags that i did with these vacuum bags and this is some panella stipticus and i i think that this was actually inoculated on i don't think that this this is millet and coffee i think that this is just brown rice flour and vermiculite I'm pretty sure that's what I put on this one. I, I can't quite remember. I should have taken better notes. But yeah, I think I can see the vermiculite kind of poking through here. But even that, like, we don't have full growth yet, but look at that. See that right there? That is a really, really tiny cluster of some Panella stipticus bitter oysters starting to peek their way out of the slit that we cut in the mushroom grow bag. And there's even, there's a slit on the back here too, and you can see that the mycelium starting to make its way out there to seek out the fresh air source and it looks like it's starting to put off some primordia to put off mushroom pins and those mushroom pins will then turn into mushrooms so this actually worked just fine too which i'm actually really really surprised because this one right here like i said was one of the first test bags that i did with uh, making up my own uh, mushroom grow bags from vacuum bags and this one i'm not really surprised that it took off the way it did because i kind of improved the process a little bit from whenever i first started experimenting with vacuum bags for mushroom grow bags and this one is pretty much perfect in every way that i could have hoped for in terms of like inoculation and growth and fruiting now uh, but this one right here here. The reason why I wanted to wait to make another video on these before I even showed this or tried to use this as, as an example is because this one I didn't properly seal on some of the edges and a couple times there were some spots that uh, opened up like on the, the melt seam where you seal these together. It kind of opened up. And I, I thought that it was just dead at that point. I thought that contaminations got in and that it was just a completely lost cause. But I ended up taking some of the tape that I use for the breathe strip, but, you know, just for uh, fresh air exchange onto these bags. And I wrapped it around where the seam split because on this one, I didn't do a double seal like I did all around here. You can see a nice double seal and this is perfectly sealed up, whereas this one right here is just a single seal. And I also way overfilled this bag bag so it kind of like bulged out quite a bit. I started ripping open these seams. I noticed it ripped open the seams right after I took it out of the incubator. Well I actually noticed the tears in the seams after I already inoculated it and I was like oh man I already have the the culture on here. I don't really want to throw it away so that's whenever I took the micro pore tape and I wrapped it around those areas that it kind of broke through and hoped for the best and it seemed to work just fine because this is now fully colonized and like I just showed, it's starting to put off these little clumps of primordial growth, which will hopefully, if given the right conditions, turn into some bitter oysters. Some glow-in-the-dark oysters, no less, that maybe I could take a pretty cool long exposure photograph of, and maybe I'll get some of my own mushrooms glowing in the dark pictures that I took myself. Both of these, to be completely honest, I just grew these because I just like to watch mushrooms grow. I don't really have any particular plans for these guys. I'm not going to eat them or use them for medicine or anything like that. Like that I just I just love to watch the way certain mushrooms grow in certain like situations and in certain varieties. And I'll tell you these these dead man's fingers are really cool looking. I really like their growth patterns and their growth properties. They're really really cool looking. Beautiful. So I guess that's pretty decent proof that these grow bags seem to function the way you would expect them to function. So that's a fairly large success in my book at least.
What do you think? And one thing that I wanted to throw in here real quick is once the mushroom, like if you're using a mushroom grow bag or if you're using a ball mason jar, whatever container you are using to hold the substrate onto what you've inoculated with a mushroom culture, once that substrate has completely colonized, like there's no uncolonized areas on the substrate, once it's colonized with the mushroom culture, that mushroom culture is then fairly resistant to contamination issues as long as it's healthy and as long as it's like not put in a stressful environment. So the reason why we can then cut a, a hole in the, the bag and let these breathe and not worry about contaminations is because at this point, the mushroom colony has established itself enough onto this substrate that it can then fight off any possible pathogens or any possible contaminations that may get on there. Whereas whenever we're first starting with a sterile bag, the reason why you want to take great care to ensure that you don't get any contaminations while you're inoculating or, or, or any step of the actual like preparation or anything like that is because say that this is not inoculated yet right we just have a bag of sterilized what did i say this was uh brown rice flour and vermiculite okay and we just kind of haphazardly put some panella stipticus culture in there you know we don't worry about cleanliness we don't worry about sanitation we don't worry about contamination so we just put that in there the problem is and yeah i know a lot of people kind of have the question of why is it that whenever you're growing mushrooms in like a home setting or like a lab setting like you have to worry so much about contamination compared to whenever they're growing out in nature and there's all kinds of microbes out there growing alongside them. Why doesn't it kill them then? Well, the truth is it, it does. There's there's a reason why mushrooms put off millions, if not billions of spores with each fruiting is because kind of like with like baby toads and like baby fish and stuff, just a very, very small percentage of those spores actually make it to maturity in order to grow into a mushroom colony that can then put off fruits for further reproduction. And another thing is whenever a mushroom is growing out in the wild, out alongside basically everything else since it's not a sterile environment and there are so many different varieties of microbes and just everything out there it actually kind of works to the mushrooms favor because with all those different microbes growing around competing for resources you know this microbe will keep this microbe in check and then this one will keep that one in check this one will keep this one in check and just so on and so forth while the mushroom kind of does its thing until it becomes established enough to where it can start to grow out and colonize the area it wants to and then it can actively fight off any pathogens or something that are trying to either colonize the mushroom or grow onto the or grow on the mushroom or it can just kind of kill off and overtake any pathogen or any bacteria or whatever that's growing in the area it wants to grow because a lot of mushrooms once they become established and mature enough they actually do put off antimicrobial compounds and some of them even produce uh hydrogen peroxide small small amounts of hydrogen peroxide of course but they produce hydrogen peroxide and antimicrobial compounds in order to kill off any competing organisms. Whereas going back to the laboratory where we start with a completely sterilized substrate like this would be, say we, we do put some live Pinella stipticus mushroom culture, you know, in there successfully, but on that Pinella stipticus culture was a couple hitchhikers, like some kind of bacteria or mold or yeast or something like that. The problem there is in this sterile environment, the microbes such as mold and bacteria and all that, they grow so much faster than the mushrooms that we're trying to grow that they will then completely overtake and outgrow these mushrooms before the mushroom itself has had a chance to establish itself and try to protect itself on the substrate on which we're trying to grow. You got to think that like microbes and mushrooms and stuff like that are always just kind of trying to punch each other out and, and take the high ground so that they can take over as much area as possible to become as strong as possible in order to propagate their species. That's, that's why sterility is so key in the early stages of growing mushrooms. But then once they become established like this, then you don't have to worry as much about contaminations. But you do want to make sure that whenever you're trying to fruit these out or whatever, that you do give them a good environment so that they are strong enough and healthy enough to continue to fight off those pathogens once they've been exposed to the air. Because as soon as we make a cut in this and as soon as we expose some of the mushroom culture, then obviously all the little airborne microbes and all that are going to start landing on there. And if it's not a healthy culture, then, they, then the culture itself can then start to quickly get taken over by contaminations. And then the microorganisms can then start to use the mushroom itself as food. So you, know, you just want to make sure that every step of the grow process up until after fruiting even is at the very least a not it doesn't have to be an ideal environment but it has to be an environment in which that species of mushroom can live does that make any sense some mushrooms 
like enoki mushrooms for example they will usually only fruit if it's like 50 or so degrees fahrenheit and most of the time if you're trying to grow enoki onto like a petri dish or something like that you can't even incubate them at too high of a temperature or else it will just kill off the culture so for certain mushrooms you want to check to see what one, the incubation temperature is, but two, what the fruiting temperature is, as well as the humidity and just all those other factors. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there. And I think I turned this part of the video into a longer part than the actual uh, showing of the little mushroom test bags here were. But that's fine. I wanted to throw that in there for everybody.